Blessed are you, holy and living one. You come to your people and you set them free. <laughs>
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. And because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I love, for I the Lord love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The word of the Lord. The response to the reading is Canticle 15. We will read the canticle in unison. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant from this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, 
for he has remembered his promise of mercy. The promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing? if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. John answered them, I baptize with water, 
Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The little house in the hill country is filled with a joyful song. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, Mary sings, the dust from the road still clinging to her robes. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. Mary is, at the same time, both more lowly and more highly favored than she appears. To outward appearances, a faithful woman from a respectable family, Mary knows that, though yet unwed, new life is growing in her. Yet that very life which will grow to become a source of scandal among her neighbors is the source not only of Mary's joy, but also her exaltation. For the child, whose life is now knit into her own, is not only Mary's son, but her God. For this reason, though her neighbors may call her what they will, generations yet unborn, will call her blessed. Indeed, they will be blessed through her blessedness. For this child, who is at present a mere cluster of living cells, will be the source of salvation for all creation. And Mary sees it. She sees the future God has laid out with such clarity, it is for her as if the divine plan is already complete. He has shown strength with his arm, she intones. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. In Mary's mind's eye, the thrones of the powerful have already been toppled. The lowly, the people who, like her, were discounted, swept aside, are now lifted up, filled up exalted. Soon, the whole world will know God's love and power, and Mary can't help but sing out the good news. Given the state of the world today, we may be a bit uneasy with Mary's description of God's future as all but guaranteed. Wherever we look, the powerful still seem comfortably enthroned, hoarding good things for themselves, while those who share the lowliness of Mary are themselves sent away, empty. America has the largest wealth gap of any wealthy nation in the world, a gap which has continued to yawn wider and wider over the past three decades. The economic chasm between those who have and those who do not is widest at the extreme ends of the spectrum. Consider this. The three wealthiest people in America, all men, by the way, own as much as the bottom 50% of this nation's population. That's right. Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, and Jeff Bezos own more than the combined wealth of over 161 million of their neighbors, our neighbors. And if the gaps are widening between the wealthiest and the rest of us, 
The economic divide between white Americans and our black and Latinx neighbors is growing as well. In 2019, the median white family in America had 41 times more wealth than the median black family and 22 times more wealth than the median Latinx family. And lest this get too cerebral, if we wonder how these economic and racist realities in America connect to our daily lives, we need look no further than the health outcomes of the COVID-19 pandemic. Studies have shown a higher death rate from COVID infections in counties with higher poverty. And according to research from the American Medical Association, in counties where the population was substantially non-white, the COVID-19 death rate was more than nine times higher when compared to counties that are substantially white, even though these counties have the same median income. Over 2,000 years have passed since the Blessed Virgin Mary sang of God's reversing the places of the powerful and the lowly as if it were already a solid fact. Yet as these examples make clear, the future God envisioned in the Magnificat, in which the strength of God's arm has scattered the proud and the powerful, well, it still seems to be a long way off. And we may find ourselves wondering if what looked at the time like Mary's prophetic insight was, in fact, the hyperbolic optimism of the youthful, the joyful. After all, we could understand how Mary might believe if God had looked favorably upon her, surely the rest of those who shared her place in the world would also be lifted by God's power called happy, fortunate, blessed. But before we make the mistake of writing off Mary's song as naive dreams, we should remember that this is just a snapshot in the chronicle of Mary's discipleship. True, we always remember Mary at this time of year, waiting alongside her as we prepare to celebrate Jesus' birth. But this song and this season are merely the beginning of Mary's journey of discipleship. For Mary is even now a disciple, the first one who knew and believed that God was going to save God's creation by entering it as a human being, a tiny child, her son and her God, Jesus. Yet Mary is still a disciple when the child now growing inside of her becomes an adult and begins his own ministry by proclaiming words that sound much like Mary's own. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. And Mary watches and learns and ponders in her heart as Jesus sets about making this scripture fulfilled by lifting up those whom he meets and blessing them with God's power and presence. Mary's discipleship continues when she walks to the foot of the cross on which her son hangs and dies after defying the powerful authorities of both the temple and praetorium. And though death seems to have silenced the source of Mary's song, nevertheless, the theme of God's triumph swells again, breaking forth in the thunderous power of the resurrection, reversing death and lifting up the Lord of life from the tomb. And it is Mary, Mary who followed her son and her Lord from the moment he was conceived through to the other side of the grave. It's Mary who is counted by name among those whose hearts were enkindled by the Spirit's fire on the day of Pentecost. And it was there, as a disciple, as a member of that community, given life through the death and resurrection of her son, 
that Mary and her fellow Christians begin to live out the life of which she sang all those years before. Yes, Mary knew in the end that only God could bring about the world she saw in those first early days of her discipleship. But she also knows that she and her fellow Christians need to begin growing themselves into an icon of the kingdom that God will one day bring about. Luke recounts this in the Acts. At the end of the story of the day of Pentecost, he writes, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Yes, Mary knows that it's God who will bring about the kingdom, but she also knew that the imagination of our hearts are powerful gifts if we, like Mary, invite God's imagining to lead us into God's own future. If Mary's song is to become our own, if we are to wait and work with eager anticipation, for the coming of the future seen by the mother of God, her voice calls us to attend to where we stand in the world today. If we're waiting for the coming of God's kingdom, we can do so either with anxiety or anticipation. And the way we wait depends in large part on where we find ourselves on the spectrum of powerful and lowly. If you, like me, find yourself in a position of privilege in the world today, we need to be asking ourselves hard questions about how we can move ourselves down from places of position and to reach with hands blessed by God, empowered by the Spirit, to help lift up those who are not as privileged. How can we use our positions of power to give voice to the voiceless, so that those who sing Mary's song today can be heard even in the halls of the powerful. This might make us uneasy. It should make us uneasy. That's a part of Mary's song, too. There's an artist on Instagram who goes by the handle Scott the Painter. And he published an icon of the Blessed Virgin Mary with the usual halo, but her head held in her hands and a grimace on her face. And he captions the image this way. There was a moment when the presence of God was felt as uneasy morning sickness. Don't be surprised if your current unease is that exact same avenue of presence. There may have been a period in Mary's journey when she too went through this same uneasy trimester. I can imagine the moment it hit, ending the spiritual high of angelic announcement and welcoming her into the uneasy, queasy feeling of actually having to go through the physical details of this divine calling. That's the rub of all divine proclamations, isn't it? The announcement that you are going to grow. I think that Scott the Painter's words speak to our present predicament. New life is taking hold. The thrones of the powerful will be toppled, and those who are lowly will be lifted up. That new life is growing in us and in this world, even if we haven't yet felt the flutter of its quickening. But we can pray for the Spirit to come And we can move our feet and let the imagination of our hearts carry us forward as we work to help bring about the future that only God will complete. 
And so when we pray in the collect today for God to stir up his power among us, to come among us in great might because we are sorely hindered by our sins, we know that God has the power to answer that prayer. And though God's answer might make us uneasy, and though relinquishing our own power and privilege may be difficult, if we are to sing Mary's song with her, that's an uneasiness we'll need to let grow inside us. Amen. Catholic Church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. God of the nations, the promise of justice inspires oppressed people in their struggle for freedom. We pray for all people in this troubled world. Rescue those suffering the tyranny of political, religious, and cultural purity and the fear of endless warfare. Give courage to those who work for peace. Hear our prayer. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord of the Church, empower us to be heralds of your peace and justice. We pray for presiding Bishop Michael, Bishop Terry, and the clergy and people of Christ Church Cathedral. Hear our prayer. Come, Lord Jesus. God of our lives, we need your presence to still the worries and doubts that distract us. We ask guidance for our leaders, President Trump, President-elect Biden, Governors Bashir and Holcomb, our mayors and our city's councils. Be with our children in their schools and with their teachers and aides and administrators. Be with the people who protect our community, for police, for firefighters, EMS personnel and doctors, nurses, aides, and laboratory technicians. Hear our prayer. Come, Lord Jesus. Generous God, you give all that is needed for us to grow into the fullness of life. Assist us to hold firm to what is lasting and to give up what is of but passing worth. We give thanks for the birthdays of Jim Wilkerson and Len Shungren. We offer our personal thanksgivings silently or aloud.
Hear our prayer. Come, Lord Jesus. Consoling God, your word gives us endless hope. We pray for victims of plague, violence, and abuse, for homeless people, particularly homeless children. We pray for those who are hungry and for those contending with mental challenges. Especially we pray for those on our cathedral prayer list. Andy Bing, Carol Brown, Charles Cooksey, Courtney Cooper, Mitzi Friedlander, Carol Kendall, Grace Kleinschmidt, Ruby Grace Coleman, Norma Lawfer, Jerry Marsh, Donna Pottinger, Joanne and George Reason, Ginger Shackleton, Tim Tice, Jean Watley, and those we named before you. We pray for those who have died, especially Dennis White, and for those who mourn, his wife, Carolyn, and all of the White family, and for those known to God alone. Hear our prayer. Come, Come Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Hear our prayers, Lord Jesus. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, you are the way to our Father, one God, now and forever. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. Think of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Good morning. On behalf of the bishop, wardens, and people of Christ Church Cathedral, it's my pleasure to have you worshiping with us today. If you'd like to learn more about what God is doing here at the cathedral and through the cathedral community in the world around us, I'd invite you to go to our website, ChristChurchLouky.org. And there you can click on the Cathedral Matters link to give you a sense of how God is working here in this community. I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of items from this week's Cathedral Matters. First, uh, a reminder that we will be having a parish meeting in lieu of our normal Zoom coffee hour following the service at 12.30 today. You can find the link to that coffee hour uh, in the Dean's Letter and in the Life and Fellowship section of Cathedral Matters. There's also a dial-in number so that if you're not the, the person who really likes to Zoom on your computer or device and would just like to call in conference call style, you can dial in the number and just put in uh, the password that you find there. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, first the uh, decision undertaken by the chapter at our November meeting to move toward a sale of Cathedral Commons and also discuss how we'll celebrate Christmas together even though we aren't able to gather and worship in person. If there are any other items on your hearts or minds, you're welcome to bring them with you as well. So I invite you to join us there again at 12.30 today. Second, uh, I want to give thanks for all of the generous gifts that you all have given to the cathedral 
in response to our annual stewardship appeal. In just a moment, we're going to bless and dedicate those pledges you've made to the glory of God and in service of God's mission and ministry that we'll be doing here at the cathedral in 2021. If you haven't yet made a pledge and would like to, there is still time to do that. Um, you can do that either by mailing your pledge card in uh, to the cathedral, and if you need another pledge card, you can contact us at the office, or you can make a pledge online. Again, going to our website, ChristChurchLouky.org, and clicking on the pledge link, which will take you to our digital pledge form. While you're there, you can also make a gift uh, either as a part of your pledge or a special gift for the season. You'll note that on the drop-down menu, um, under the, the Give link, you can find a, uh, a place where you can donate uh, to, in support of the flowers, which we will be using to beautify this space for our celebration of Christmas. So again, you click on Donate and choose uh, Christmas slash Easter flowers from the drop-down menu. That'll help make sure that we have flowers to celebrate the Christmas season here in a few short weeks. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, giver of all that is good and true and beautiful and life-giving, these cards represent our sweat, they represent our lives, they represent our dreams. The pledges which we make on them are but tokens of the awesome gifts that have been given to us and they are pledged in thanksgiving for all that we have received, for all we have been inspired to be, for all we are challenged to become in this place. May they be the first fruits of all we have and not what we have left over, so that we may live out as best as possible how you give to us. May we see them as our offering to you, sacred, holy, yet earth filled with possibility. May we hold this image in our hearts and our minds, so that as we watch our offerings each week come to your table, we can see our very selves being part of this offering. It is us on the table, living sacrifice to you. Amen.
the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is truly right and good and joyful to give thanks to you, O Holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death, and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life. But when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels, and with all the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us. And so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. Christ, Christ will come again. 
Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The disciples knew the Lord Jesus in the breaking of the bread. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. I invite you to join with me in an act of spiritual communion. You can find the prayer in your service bulletin or in the video description. Let us pray. Jesus, my Savior, I ask you to come into my heart and fill me with your love. Although many cannot physically join with others to celebrate the Eucharist today, I desire to offer my thanksgivings and prayers in union with all who worship you, wherever they may be. And although many cannot receive you now sacramentally, in the bread and wine of Holy Communion. Still, I desire to receive your body and blood spiritually and feed on your love, that I may be united with you and with all your people in one communion and fellowship, your mystical body, the Church, now and evermore. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God, by whose providence our Savior Christ came among us in great humility, sanctify you with the light of his blessing and set you free from all sin. Amen. May he whose second coming in power and great glory we await make you steadfast in faith, joyful in hope, and constant in love. Amen. May you, who rejoice in the first advent of our Redeemer, at his second advent be rewarded with unending life. Amen. And the blessing of God, Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Thanks be to God.